This is Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for resolute hope in an anxious age. Wherever you're listening from, welcome. I'm your host, Colin Hansen, and I'm glad you're here for today's conversation. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Here's the quote. In our world at this moment, dialogue is dying and righteous indignation abounds. People shout over each other, screaming louder and louder, but it isn't clear that anybody is listening. While some say that crises bring out the best in people, they also bring out the worst. Wherever we turn, we face a barrage of accusations of fake news, fake science, and fake concern for others. The volume may be turned up, but our dueling monologues speak only to ourselves and to our allies. What we need most is to understand and revitalize the dialogic spirit, end quote. As from the new book, Minds Wide Shut, How the New Fundamentalisms Divide Us, published by Princeton University Press. And I'm joined on Gospel Bound by the authors, Morton Shapiro and Gary Saul Morrison. Shapiro has been president of Northwestern University in Chicago since 2009. Morrison teaches Slavic languages and literature at Northwestern and is currently at work on a study of the brothers Karamazov, which I can't wait to see. Uh, Shapiro and Morrison describe fundamentalism as, quote, radical simplification of complex questions and the inability to learn either from experience or from opposing views. And they warn this, we are entering an era when politics seems to be conducted as war by other means. And a little later this, quote, fundamentalist thinking is utopian, if not apocalyptic. One knows the truth and those who disagree are ignorant, evil, or insane. All goodness belongs to one's own camp, end quote. Among their proposed solutions is employing case studies, especially from great literature for experience-based learning. And I'm eager to ask them about grand theories and alternative facts and economics. And I'm grateful they've agreed to join me on Gospel Bound in the spirit of further learning and dialogue. Morty and Saul, thanks for joining me. Oh, delighted to be here. It's an honor to be here, Colin. It's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, So I'll start for you. For years, we heard from the likes of the late Christopher Hitchens that religion poisons everything. So as religion declines in the West, why does ideological intensity keep rising? Ideological intensity has nothing to do with religion. You can have ideologically intense people who are religious or not religious. If you just think of the Soviet Union, where they're officially atheistic, I don't know anybody more ideologically intense than them. So uh, the two are completely separate categories. There's no relation between the two. Morty, I want to jump in here with you. And I'm sorry for what you and your family had endured last year uh, from protesters in Evanston. I've followed the situation closely, and I admire that you stood up to them for crossing several lines. Around the same time, actually, Saul, you wrote on the suicide of the liberals for First Things, an article that I had picked up and spread around to others. But Morty, I was actually a little surprised by your response based on what I've seen from other universities. How does that experience from last fall relate to the message in Minds Wide Shut? Well, Colin, that's kind of a loaded question for the first. I thought you were going to give me a softball. Like, uh, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good one. I know, just, I mean, that was a public thing. and dialogue or something as a person <laughs> of faith. But, you know, I, I would just say that, you know, um, I always remind people if, if freedom of speech isn't respected on your alma mater, you didn't, you didn't let on that, of course, you took a course in Russian literature with Saul. It was before I got here, not that you're old, but uh, I was still teaching at Williams at the time. But, um, you know, I mean, you, you got to respect free speech and you also have to respect different generations who really care. And there's a lot to care on about Colin. And, you know, but, you know, for me, I, I draw the line. I draw the line on violence. And, you know, I think history suggests, and we talk about that at some length in Minds Wide Shut, that if the intelligentsia starts saying, okay, that's okay, you know, you're really upset, this is bad, there's a lot of things that are bad in the world, the systemic racism, the anti-blackness and the like, but if you start turning your head and saying, you know, violence is okay, you know, we describe that, we call that Saul the slide, right, that what happens with people said, well, this was unacceptable. And then a year later, it's acceptable. And then they go on to the next thing. So I, I, I just think you'd need to draw the line at intimidation and violence. And so I tried to draw, but it's not to say that some of the people you know, who are the loudest are, are insincere or that there is no reason for them to be upset. There's a lot of reasons to be upset. 
it's just how you articulate that and how you manifest it. And again, you know, once the leaders start saying, oh, you know, I understand you, you were sincere and then certain behavior is condoned, then it's, it's I think it's history suggests it's a real problem. Well, and that's exactly why I paired those observations together, because that's the thesis of what Saul writes in The Suicide of the Liberals, where he narrates Russian history of exactly that uh, that trend. Uh, Saul, I thought postmodernism was supposed to be the end of grand theories. I'm amazed that you had to write this, quote, it isn't true that anything short of a totalizing theory is somehow flawed, at best a stopgap, until such a theory is found, end quote. So what happened to this postmodern uh, critique of grand theories? Well, it's complicated, but the short answer would be that the critique of theories was always the critique of somebody else's theories. <clears throat> it wasn't the critique of theory per se. Just the way, you know, when people do a discipline called the sociology of knowledge, where you only believe this because of your social condition, it's always the sociology of somebody else's knowledge, never the professors doing the analysis. The postmodernists have a kind of what we call a negative fundamentalism. It's just as categorical. It assumes that either there's an ironclad way of knowing the truth, or there's nothing. They just take the nothing. But they only take it when it's convenient, when there's something to oppose. Otherwise, they know the truth. And uh, I I'm talking about the extremes here, not everybody who you know is influenced right. by any of these theories, just at, at the limits. By the way, my article is called The Suicide of, was originally called The Suicide of the Russian Liberals. <laughs> they, they dropped the, the word. <laughs> well, I mean, that is truth in advertising. It is specifically... You're, I think what I what I loved about your classes, what I loved about your writing, is you let the history and you let the literature sit with us. You're not just trying to mine it for polemics. No. And that's why I commend that article, because it's not just mining for like, oh, see, now we can identify the liberals with today. No, it's, oh. it's sitting there, what Morty was talking about there of, we do need to learn from history, but that doesn't mean we're bound to repeat it in the same ways. Yeah, I would, I wasn't commenting on American liberals. I was commenting on Russian liberals. And I leave it to um, the readers to decide what parallels, whether among liberals or anybody else, there might be today. I pose questions based on the Russian example, and then leave it to the reader to, to answer them. I don't want to answer them for them. It's too complicated for that. It is. I, I uh, said to some friends the other day that after a long day on the internet, I love to relax by reading Russian history. <laughs> just a foolish thing, but it helps to illustrate how crazy the online experience can be now if, uh, you know, curling up with a little Vasily Grossman uh, in the end <laughs> night is, is how you relax, which I have to say um, is the case with me. Uh, Morty, what does it mean to, hopefully this will be more of a softball, okay? Uh, the softball team looks good this year also. They're 11 and 1. Thank you for noticing. Oh, I'm always noticing more. You can always count on me for that. What does it mean to lead a university whose motto is whatsoever is true from Philippians 4, 8, when my truth and alternative facts are wielded as a kind of impenetrable defense against dialogue and disagreement? I've been a president for more than two decades. It's never been more difficult than it is now, which is why I think the average completed presidential term, last I saw, was down to six and a half years. I will do a total, God willing, of uh, 22 years uh, at two different places. Uh, not easy. You know, we were just talking about my, you know, role with Veritas and things that are very important to you and to many of your listeners. I, I am a observant Jew, so a person of faith and you know, so I take the motto very seriously. I, I really do think that you have challenges in a secular college or university. And a lot of my friends always thought it would be an easier fit, an easier fit for me. And, and I have friends like Father John Jenkins, for example, at Notre Dame, or Jack DeJoy, and a great old buddy of mine at Georgetown. And whenever I talk to them, I say, "God, I it must be so easy for you." <laughs> not, not that it is, but compared to me. You know, given, you know, the nature of secular higher education. But, you know, those they're not just words for me, you know, and, and sometimes faculty and staff and students roll their eyes when, you know, I don't take anything for granted. And I always say, God willing, when I say, God bless you, it's not a throwaway line, as Saul knows. 
a person of faith and I'm proudly a person of faith and it enters into everything I do. The topics I work on as an as an applied econometrician and in economics and labor economics to the speeches I give to how I run baccalaureate service, my favorite service of the, of the entire year. And, you know, everything I say and everything I do, you know that, Colin, if you're a person of faith, you, you don't draw the line and you don't leave it. You know, when you get to the office, it's who you are. Yeah. Uh, so you, one thing you write in here, and you take up a lot of the chapters in this book, of course, looking at literature and, and criticism. And I was a history major in addition to to journalism and saw some of this develop within within history. I think it's endemic to a good bit of the of the liberal arts these days. But you write this, what good criticism does not do and must not do is to enclose the author in our epoch. Explain how the new fundamentalisms have divided the study of literature, your expertise. Well, the way you need to learn from literature, you must begin by assuming it has something to teach you. If you take the stance that we are here to judge it, how does it measure up to our standards, and they are assumed to be true, then you obviously can't learn anything from it, and why bother to read it, which is why, in fact, fewer people do read it, and it's often not taught. You want to presume that not just you look at the other period or epoch or, or author, but that it what would it say if it looked at you? See yourself through other eyes, and great literature can help you do that. But to do that, you have to acknowledge the difference. You have to acknowledge that the author is probably a lot smarter than you are as a reader. Let yourself, first of all, identify with that point of view, suspend yours for a while, and then see yourself through that point of view, and that's how you actually can learn. And that's the point of reading great literature, just in the same way it's the point of studying other cultures. You're not going to learn a lot, a lot if you study, you know, medieval Europe or China or any other culture of the world simply by judging, well, you do this wrong and you do that right, based on the prejudices of Americans today. You have to see the world from their point of view and therefore enlarge your possibility, your sense of what possibilities humanity has. And one of the, I, I teach a lot of uh, civil rights history here in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we've got a robust uh, Northwestern Alumni Network, not a chapter yet, but we've got some folks down here. And one of the ways I, I describe is our history is, is to say that it's like, it's like your grandmother uh, thinking that she can do no wrong is naivete. Thinking that she can do no right is arrogance. Thinking that you're a lot like her is wisdom. At least that's what I've picked up, Saul, in, in some of how you helped me to understand literature and how it, it reads us as we read it. Yeah. Dialogue, which is you know supreme value of our book, depends on respecting the point of view of others, which means you first have to recognize that they are others and that reasonable, intelligent, well-intentioned people, as well-intentioned and intelligent as you are, can see things differently. I sometimes don't understand the, the postmodern view, which you know suggests that we have to acknowledge cultural difference and then we have to see other cultures as fitting into our paradigms. The two seem to be contradictory. You know, you have to have a conversation with somebody who's not like yourself, and that's true in our own culture too. Not everybody is the same. And I, I used to have a, uh, a Russian history teacher who was a um, Persian and a Baha'i who used to say, always remember, he would say, there are always as many swine on your side of the issue as on the other. <laughs> it's not always completely true, but it's worth assuming. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and we've got, uh, we, again, we have history to thank us uh, for that in many, many, many examples, thinking of the French and Russian revolutions in particular, as if that was just a couple examples. Uh, Morty, we've talked here before about how you teach economics in a university that produces a few econ majors. Um, why do you think it's so appealing for students to adopt certain economic ideologies that public policy and history, this is pulling out of your book, plainly show cannot work for the common good. It, 
I guess a, another way to put it would be, it strikes me as a little odd to graduate students who enter the world of finance as committed socialists. A little odd? Is, is that it, Colin? I mean, but, I, I'm, I'm just trying to undersell it here, Marty. But as, as I learned from you from uh, being a fan of your podcast, that one of the recent ones you said, and I just shared this with, so I don't remember if it was Joe Henrik or I think it was Thaddeus Williams. When you said people, I think your quote, Colin, first of all, you're like, oh, he actually listens to me. Well, I do. I don't listen to every Northwestern alum. We have 250,000. But if they're as smart as you, I do. Um, you said, look, there are there are socialist party members. I think you said in Scandinavia who use markets more than we I do did. in the U.S. So you got to be careful about that label a little. But there is that chapter in the book on fun on the economy. And I think the, the broader question, Colin, you might be asking is, you know, why don't people rely on data more? I mean, it's all just said our definition of a fundamentalist going back to uh, Karl Popper, the great philosopher of science, is that you can't falsify your view. And if you can't falsify your view, then, you know, there's no hope for dialogue, as Saul just said. And, the, you know, the market fundamentalists believe in their core that markets always should reign supreme. It's a misreading, as we argue in this book and our previous book of wealth and nations, ignoring theory of moral sentiments, you know, the earlier book by Adam Smith. And, you know, people like things simple. And the simple view is laissez-faire. Government always messes things up. Let markets reign supreme. Adam Smith didn't believe it. And anybody who believes this doesn't know and understand anything about history. But the more worrying side, and I think this kind of is what you were, you were going, is the anti-market fundamentalists that somehow, uh, you know, capitalism is the problem. I hear that all the time, Colin. It's always the problem under capitalism. Well, you show me a better system. Now, I'm a mainstream economist and mainstream economists are not neutral between on one side market fundamentalism and the other one anti-market. We're much closer to the former than the latter. You know, by definition, I believe in markets. I don't, but I believe sometimes they fail and not just because of negative externalities and public goods, the traditional things. I think quite often, you know, markets end up with you know, inefficiencies and injustices. That said, you know, I'm much closer as a mainstream economist to believing that the market should work because whenever there are instances in Colin, you said, look at history, look at the Soviet Union, um, for example. <laughs> I mean, is that, a, you know, when the government comes in there with their self-interest and their inefficiencies, you know, it's so much worse than the market solution. So my view as a mainstream economist generally let markets reign supreme. And then when there are injustices and things you can't live with, with the distribution of wealth and income, et cetera, try to mediate that. But if you start from the government making these decisions, you're not going to have economic output to use to redistribute because it's all going to go away. And that's the lesson of history. So, you know, again, that's the chapter. And, and then finally, you know, there's so much evidence you know, that economists agree on minimum wage, on rent control, on carbon offsets, on trading pollution permits, on health care, uh, not on everything. Wealth tax, we're a little bit over, but marginal tax rates. And, you know, we, we agree, but then people use it either from the right or the left. And they misstate, you know, they always say on one hand, on the other hand, well, there's not two hands there. Most economists, as we try to argue in some detail, they agree on almost everything that's important about economic policy. Again, this is why the book was so refreshing to me, because I felt like you guys tackle many of the real challenges and you don't talk around them. That's why I was eager to, to have this conversation with both of you. And so lately, I've just been wondering what I've what I've missed. I mean, this gets as a typical alumni uh, thing, right? Like, wow, I have things changed in this way, because I, what I loved about Northwestern is how I was challenged by professors, even when we disagreed about important things, really important things like religion, including, I mean, I think just, I was just sitting down thinking about this list of people. I'm sure you guys, you know, these people, Peter Hayes, Charlie Moskos, Erwin Wilde, Dick Schwartzlos, Bob McClory, Bob Gundlach, Mark Witte, just some of the professors I got to study with across a remarkable set of disciplines and changed my life precisely because we disagreed on things. Um, the late Bob McClory and I had just long conversations 
about Christianity, about religion, and we disagreed strongly with each other, but really respected each other in that process. It does seem from higher education to politics, to journalism, to religion, though, Saul, a lot of the mood has shifted And I just don't see as many attempts any longer to persuade. It seems that many today are looking simply for confirmation to what they already believe, including in education. What did did I miss? I mean, what's... What do you see as having changed, or maybe I just wasn't picking up on what was already there? Do you see this among the faculty or the students are you referring to? Oh, students I'm thinking about in particular, students. Oh, well, my experience of students, of course, may be biased by the ones who are willing to take my class, which may not be the mainstream, but a fair number take my classes, and I find that most of, almost all of them are open to different points of view as long as they're presented in a convincing way, the way, you know, Dostoevsky does. That's why I let the, when I teach, I let the authors do the speaking. I don't, you know, students are not supposed to know what I think about and we don't. politics and religion or anything right. like that. And I won't tell them if they, you know, if, if they ask, because I'm not important. It's the writer who's important. You know, so I teach through them. And I find that, you know, again, it may not be representative, but the students who I encounter are almost all willing to open their minds a bit and see the world from a different point of view. Maybe if I, you know, if these writers directly challenge more of what they, of their core beliefs, but they do challenge a few of their core beliefs and they still seem open, you know, to me. I suspect that there's a lot more uniformity among the faculty than among the students. Hmm. Morty, what do you think? Well, you know, it's hard to tell, Colin, what, what, it's gone. You know, I'm not a sociologist, so I'm not trained for that or anthropologist or psychologist. But, you know, you know, as an uh, economist, you always look for what's the sea change, what's the catalyst. And certainly it's social media. You know, I mean, back when you were there, you, you could disagree and, and be a proud person of faith. And, you know, you're not going to, I think, get into arguments through social media and people aren't going to signal you out for this or that because you have one belief or another. And, and, you know, with the world of social media, you you know, you really need to be careful, right? I mean, it's just sort of, it's everywhere out there and it it makes it very difficult to have productive dialogue, but not impossible. And, you know, I meet with a lot of students and most of them really, I I don't, I don't buy that we're indoctrination mills or anything. I, I, I don't buy it. And, I know many of those faculty you listed, and many of them are still here, teaching great work, great things, and teaching people how to think. And you know, it's it's so easy from really from the conservative side to say that because the vast majority of faculty are Democrats, registered as Democrats, we have a footnote in that. I don't know if you noticed in one of the chapters, and and we pointed out that the numbers are a little scary, but you know, I I just I think it underestimates the the confidence and the individuality of our undergrads in particular who, you know, even if you have a polemicist as a teacher, you know, saying, this is what I want you to repeat. You think our students, Gen Z is going to, they're going to sit there and go, yeah, yeah, right, professor. No, they, they rebel against that. You know, again, I've been teaching 43 years, so a little bit longer. We've been doing this a long time with a lot of different generations. I have a lot of respect for this generation And, you know, even though with the world of social media, it it makes it more difficult for them to navigate friendships and and the like, but they're really trying. God bless them. Speaking of some of those changes, Morty, I wondered during your years, those 43 years as a professor, university uh, president, how would you describe the changes in students' um, sort of mental health, anxiety, and how does it relate to some of what you were approaching here in uh, Minds Wide Shut? Well, it's certainly, I, I know from my own three kids as well, um, that, you know, and Saul knows from his, I mean, a lot of issues that, the good news is some things were kind of pushed under the rug, so to speak, and, and now they're clear, they don't have the same stigma. Boy, I remember when we built a new psychological counseling center when I was president of, of, of Williams, and we needed to have a door in the back so people can, I don't think... This is a generation who does, you know, is not afraid to admit that they need help. And that's the good news. Bad news is they need help um, probably more than ever because of the pressures of social media and the like and the increased divisiveness in society. And it's, you know, I mean, again, I'm not a sociologist, but some, I, you know, I, I read things like you read, Colin. I mean, I, I think that 
you know, I think faith is a, is a good answer to confusion and, and a lack of confidence. You know, I, I believe that. And, and, I, and I also believe that some people say, of course, that it's, you know, the trophy generation that, you know, when, when I played a little league, you only got a trophy if you won. Now you get a participation and, you know, there's a lot of that. And some of that is really overblown, I think. But the reality is that, especially to get into a school like a, a Northwestern or a Yale or Princeton or a Dartmouth or an Amherst, you don't have a lot of failure anymore. You know, I mean, even the admit rate at your alma mater, you know, we were admitting 30 percent. So the value of your degree has gone up. You would get in anyway, but a lot of your peers might have a trouble because there's just not that much room. And the admit rate that we're in right now and we're going to be notifying in two weeks is is going to be four percent. People say, why are they not more resilient? Well, they never had experience with failure. And that's not their fault. That's the fault of their parents and of society and of the educational system, K-12. So when all of a sudden you, you face failure, because you're taking, you know, your pre-med and you have a course like chem or bio, or you, you want to be an econ major until you take econometrics. And, you know, and they're like, oh my God, I, I've been the you know, I've always w- succeeded. I've always won. Here are my trophies. And and then we lament that they're not tougher and more resilient. Well, we created that generation. So as much as I love that generation, I wish they had had more experience with failure. But frankly, if they did, we probably wouldn't see them saw at Northwestern. Yeah, that's. I, I appreciate that you don't try to offer a simple answer. One of my favorite repeat guests on this show has been uh, Jonathan Haidt, and I think there's a lot of truth to what he and Greg Lukianoff and others have been talking about in some of the transformations. David Brooks, of course, has been writing about this for a long period of time, and and I think the only way to – you can't just bemoan another generation. You have to have a position of, of sympathy and understanding for them and also a recognition that whatever traits you see in them are reflective of how they were raised and how they were encouraged, how they were incentivized. So if you're criticizing them in many ways, you're really criticizing yourself. And I I just simply also agree that there's no way to look back. I mean, my time at Northwestern was when people got cell phones for the first time. And of course, that changes the parent dynamic. When all of a sudden you're accessible all the time. And that was before smartphones, but we still had the cell phones. And then the year after I graduated was Facebook. And that, I think, is the major generational divide. It ushers in all of that social media and it creates new opportunities in many ways, but new challenges. Morty, I want to stick with you on this next question. Um, it's got a, a minute or so or a couple minutes here left. You've all of in, another guest I've had here has written on the shift of institutions away from forming us to becoming platforms for individual performance. How do you see university education as formative in preventing the rush toward fundamentalist ideologies on the right and left? Well, I think, Colin, it comes to being humble. You know, one of the great things from faith I think you get is humility. Uh, And um, part of that humility is realizing you don't know everything, even if you're really smart and you're 20 years old, (laughs) you know, you can learn from others. And again, we go to great length in the in, in the book to define fundamentalism far, very far removed from a century ago when the fundamentalists were interpreting Christian text as we talk about Saul wrote that part in the chapter so it, it's gone to something else but you know people ask me all the time Colin you know what are the attributes of a successful undergraduate education when you send your 2,000 seniors out into the world what do you have I hope and I I, I hope they're quantitatively adept, uh, adept, and no surprise as somebody who does econometrics. And I hope they have an aesthetic appreciation too, because life is more than just numbers, you know, that you really want to have a respect for art and music and all the things that make life worth living. You want to have obviously an honest respect and appreciation for diversity and inclusion. In some cases, you want to strengthen religion, faith, religious faith, which is surprising for a president of a secular university. But, you know, when that happens, too, it, it makes me really happy. But the most important thing is to graduate with humility. And that's hard for a generation that, you know, they're all valedictorians and they're all going on to great success like you did, Colin. And, you know, being humble. And I always remind them at graduation that your education's beginning. It's not ending. And I'm not talking about the two thirds of 
Northwestern and similar alums who go on to get masters, PhDs, professional school degrees, et cetera. I'm, I'm talking about educating yourself over a lifetime. So I want them to have the tools to educate themselves for a lifetime. And I think they do. They know how to read. They know how to write. But the important thing is the humility to know that education isn't over. And that's one thing that Saul you know, is the most popular teacher at Northwestern teaching Russian literature, Colin. And people ask me, you know, why isn't the most popular course coding? Why isn't X10 like at Harvard? You know, and I said, no, it's Russian literature. Russian literature, that prepares them for the world. And I said, what could better prepare them for the world? So maybe Saul wants to say what he hopes he gets out. <laughs> yeah, of let's hear it. Let's hear it, Saul. those thousands of students he sends out <laughs> into the world. Well, I want them to be humble in the sense that they know that they can learn from others who are unlike themselves and the great writers who they can go to for wisdom. And the wisdom is endless. And the more you get, the more there is to get, the more you'll see, the more you appreciate great books. And that will then carry over because in, in reading, let's say, great novels, one of the key things you do is identify with a person unlike yourself, in a culture, period, psychology, most important. And you learn not just to be told to empathize with others, you do it for hundreds and hundreds of pages and therefore get practice in it. My hope is that doing that with fictional characters, you can get inside their head as you can't with real people, right? But you will develop the inclination and the habits of empathizing with others. You'll make that effort to project yourself, you know, instead of saying, how can you think that way? To think, he's thinking the same thing about me. What does it look like from the other point of view? What do I look like? And if you do that, that's a kind of humility, but it also gets you a kind of wisdom because it's a difference between monocular and binocular vision. You can get perspective. Uh, Saul, just one last question here for you. Uh, you both conclude the book by writing this with rising fundamentalism all around us. Hate thine enemy seems to be the catchphrase of the day, end quote. And so the question for you is how we can distinguish between the conviction and the content of fundamentalism. So, for example, you may regard that following the Bible's teaching on sexuality to be a form of a dangerous fundamentalism, as you allude to in the book. But what if the same Bible seriously obeyed demands that believers love their enemies and considers other more important than themselves, of course, talking about the New Testament here, what if the fundamentalism follows a savior who died for his enemies and prayed for their forgiveness? So, again, just going back and distinguishing between the attitude and the content, because what if the serious pursuit of the text is precisely what imbues you with that drive for humility? That, that's, I think, precisely it, regardless of what your you know position is on marriage or any number of other issues, if you have the idea that, you know, your enemies, and you don't have to regard every opponent as an enemy, that you can, you know, see the world from their point of view, even if you don't go the extreme of loving your literal enemies, going in that direction so that you at least understand sympathetically. You don't have to conclude you agree with the person to make the effort to recognize that that person is as sincere in their point of view you are, may have as good reasons as you do, and looks at you the way you look at, at them, and then develop a kind of wisdom, humble wisdom about the multiple possibilities you know, of belief. You can do that while maintaining your belief, but there's a difference between believing in something and believing it as something which is absolutely certain and that everybody has to agree or else. They're, those are completely different. Well, and that's the, that's the challenge for a missionary religion like Christianity is to be simultaneously seeking to persuade others while at the same time to be loving them no matter what they decide, no matter what decision they, pat, they, they, they pursue. And where Christians do not do that, where they cannot respect others, is where Christianity ceases to be following its own beliefs. And unfortunately, we do see a lot of that, which is in part why this book has been written. Um, and I really appreciate you guys for taking the time to talk with me about it. Minds Wide Shut, How the New Fundamentalisms Divide Us, published by Princeton University Press. The author is Morton Shapiro, Gary Saul Morrison from Northwestern University. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Colin. It was an honor. Yes, it was. 
Thank you for listening to today's episode of Gospel Bound. For more information, including past episodes, transcripts, and to sign up for my newsletter, go to tgc.org slash gospelbound. If you like what you've heard, you may also like my new book written with Sarah Zalstra called Gospel Bound, Living with Resolute Hope in an Anxious Age. You can find it wherever books are sold. Thank you.